you know much about John's gospel, you know chapter 3, chapter 4 in particular, uh, just loaded with some um, wonderful accounts. Actually, what what we'll see in chapters 3 through 5 are four encounters that Jesus has with four different individuals. And more or less, it's structured like there's this encounter that Jesus has with the individual, and then there's some commentary or reflection on that encounter, and then there's another encounter. Uh, Like today, we're going to see uh, Jesus encounters Nicodemus, who's described as a ruler of the Jews. Then in chapter 4, we're going to see uh, Jesus with the Samaritan woman. Sometimes we call her the woman at the well. Uh, Chapter uh, 5, we're introduced to a Gentile official whose son is critically ill. Uh, And then there is the man that the Lord heals on the Sabbath, an invalid that the Lord heals on the Sabbath. And So each of these, we're going to see the encounter, and then there's the reflection and commentary on that encounter. But uh, simply put, what we have in these four encounters, on the one hand, are people who are in need. They're in desperate need. Sometimes they understand their need, sometimes they don't see their need, but they're all desperately in need. And then there is one, who is Jesus, who meets the need. So on the one hand, we have needy sinners. On the other hand, we have a sufficient Savior, an all-sufficient Savior. And so the question is, how is it that these sinners connect with this all-sufficient Savior? What is it that this all-sufficient Savior is doing for these sinners? That's really what we get in these three chapters. So this morning, follow along as I read John chapter 3, and I'll start in verse 1. And we're going to read down through the first 15 verses. This is John chapter 3, and beginning in verse 1. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel and yet do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Let's pray. Oh, our Father, we turn to you in prayer, because even as this Scripture teaches What needs to be done in our lives, what must happen, can only happen as the Spirit works, as the Spirit makes it happen. The Spirit blows where He will. We don't control that. We just see the evidences of it. And so, Father, we pray, oh, dear Father, may the Spirit blow on our hearts today. Oh, God, may you give life where there is death. 
Father, may you give your people a renewed sense of awe for the wonder, the amazement, the miracle of the new birth. And, O oh, Father, may we be renewed in our commitment of preaching a Savior who for us in our place was lifted up. Who is worthy for such things? But Lord, in Christ, you have called us and equipped us. You've made us worthy because we stand in his excellency. And so, Father, it's with that hope we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the message Jesus wants you and me to get from this account is as clear as it can be. Verse 7, you must be born again. Can't be said any simpler. It can't be said with any more or less force. You must be born again. You must be born again. I must be born again. You must be born again. Because if you are not born again, you will not have eternal life. If you are not born again, you will not enter into the kingdom of God. If you are not born again, you will perish. As you've noticed, we read right up to what maybe is the most familiar verse in all the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not what? Perish but have eternal life. Perishing is a reality to any and all who are not born again. Such weighty matters this morning, I can, I can just pray that the Spirit of God works in your heart. I see how limited I am, but I know the Spirit of God can work in your heart to help you see that, to help you believe that. You'll go all week long and unless you intentionally turn to God's Word, you won't hear that message anywhere. If anything, you'll hear that kind of talk mocked and belittled. But my friend, it's true. You must be born again or you will perish. Next week, we'll talk a lot more about what it is to perish. But it's to live forever outside the presence of God in a place the Bible describes as hell. It's what it is to perish. So the issues before us this morning could not be any weightier, could not be any more important, any more critical than the message Jesus gave to Nicodemus on that night, you must be born again. Now, how are you born again? What does it mean to be born again? What's this being born again all about? Well, I would summarize the message like this. Simply put, the message of these 15 verses is this. Like Nicodemus, we are spiritually dead and outside the kingdom of God. That's true of Nicodemus, and Nicodemus is really standing in all of our place. He's representing all of us. Like Nicodemus, we are spiritually dead and outside the kingdom of God. You see what the next word is, though? But. It's a great word, isn't it? But God. But God the Spirit gives life to those who believe in Jesus. That's the message this morning. Let's break it down in those three parts. Let's first of all talk about what Jesus meant when he says that we are spiritually dead and outside the kingdom of God, or what is it that Jesus says so that we know that's what he meant when he said it? Then we'll talk about the life that the Spirit gives, and then we'll talk about believing in Jesus. Let's begin with this, though. We are spiritually dead and outside the kingdom of God. We're talking about our true spiritual condition, our true natural spiritual condition. This is how everyone is naturally speaking. Now, Nicodemus stands for us in our place this morning with this. So let's, let's look at what we know about Nicodemus. There's something just from, the, just from the commentary John gives us about Nicodemus that we can apply to this whole thing about being born again. Not just what it is, but what it is not. First of all, notice this. Verse 1, John tells us that Nicodemus was a man of the Pharisees, a ruler of the Jews. 
The Pharisees, of course, were the religious leaders uh, of their day. They were part of what was called the Sanhedrin, which was the governing, ruling body of the Jews that was located in Jerusalem. We would know this about Nicodemus because of what we know about Pharisees. Number one, we would know that he was well acquainted with the Old Testament. I mean, this guy knew his Bible. Jesus even referred to him as not even a teacher of Israel, the teacher of Israel, emphasizing the fact that when it comes to the Scriptures, this guy knows the Scriptures, at least he knows about the Scriptures. Obviously, he doesn't know the true message of the Scriptures, but this guy knows the content of the Scriptures, and he teaches others. Secondly, we would know that as a Pharisee that he's a ruler of the Jews. He's part of that governing body, the Sanhedrin. He's a man of high position of his day and of his people. And as a Pharisee, we also would know that he would be a man of excellent moral character. You know, if you know about the Gospels and you've studied the life of Jesus in the Gospel, oftentimes the Pharisees, well, I mean, they, were, they opposed Christ. Most of them were vehemently opposed to Christ. And so sometimes we just think completely negative about Pharisees. But let's understand the fact anyone would want a Pharisee as their neighbor. He would bring the rake back that he borrows. I mean, this guy is of high moral character. This is the kind of guy that everyone in the community would look at as someone who is of high position, of someone who is to be respected. Now, just, just look at those ideals again. He's a Bible man, he has morally excellent character, and he is an overachiever. But also listen to this. Still, to this man, to this outstanding man, Jesus said, you must be born again. So obviously, being born again, having eternal life, entering into the kingdom of God is something more than, maybe something altogether different than these characteristics of Nicodemus. Need to just kind of underscore that again. Being born again, it's not how much Bible you know. Being a born again is not how much you've achieved. Being a born again is not how other people see you. Born again is not how excellent your moral character is. It's something different than that. Now, secondly, we know this from verse 2. Let's not try not to spend much time about this. He came to Jesus by night. What are we to make of that? Uh, some would suggest that he was uh, afraid of what the other Pharisees and the Sanhedrin and, and the uh, other uh, Jews would think of him. Uh, so he came at night under the cover of darkness, maybe, although it's not till the end of chapter 5 that we learn that the Pharisees are beginning to really oppose Jesus. Maybe by this time they're not so much opposed to him. Some have suggested then that John is just uh, using Nicodemus coming at night to illustrate that not only was uh, Nicodemus literally in the dark when he talked to Jesus, he was spiritually in the dark when he talked to Jesus. And when you take how John uses this word night, and at times he uses it in his gospel to illustrate spiritual darkness, it may be that John's point is that he really did come at night, but he wants us to see that not only is he coming in the dark, he is in the dark. That's why he keeps saying, what, what are these things? What's, what are you saying? What's going on? And Jesus says, yeah, you're really in the dark. You don't get these things. Number three, though, maybe most importantly, we know this about Nicodemus, that he was fascinated with Jesus. He really was fascinated with Jesus. He's not coming as a critic of Jesus. He's not coming with someone, as someone who's against Jesus. He speaks very highly of him. Notice again in verse 2, John tells us this, that Nicodemus said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher from God. I mean, there's, there's some, you are different. You are truly unique. He recognizes the otherness of Jesus. For no one can do these signs. Remember that word? It's talking about miraculous signs. No one can do these signs unless God is with him. I really think Nicodemus was coming to Jesus because he saw in Jesus as one who could take him deeper in what he already believed and embraced. 
as one who could, could reveal to him even greater things about his own religion. He saw in Jesus one he was fascinated with, one who could help him go higher, go deeper in his own understanding, his own religion. He was very fascinated with Jesus. But we need to see this as well, that this new birth that Jesus talks about is not new or better religion. Hope you heard that this morning. Hope you hear that. It's not new and better religion. Being born again isn't Bible knowledge. It's not high moral character. It's not what you've achieved. It's not more and better religion religion. What it is we're going to get to, but we need to see this first. What Jesus says about Nicodemus is what we really need to see, not only John's commentary on him, but Jesus would would say at least three things about Nicodemus, and he would say the same three things about all of us. Nicodemus, first of all, Jesus says, is of the flesh. Jesus said, verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Now, to be of the flesh is more than having a physical body. Jesus had a physical body. Jesus was truly human, but Jesus was not of the flesh. Being of the flesh, get this, describes living life on planet Earth that is apart from or absent of the life of God. See, you can be of the flesh and be religious. Matter of fact, the flesh loves religion. You can be of the flesh and yet still be religious and yet not be of God. Because Jesus puts it as an either or. You're either of the flesh or you are of God. Or as he says, of the spirit of God. It's one or the other. Now let's just step aside from it for a moment and let's, let's summarize what we learn in the Bible, in particular the New Testament, about this flesh. What it means to be of the flesh. Really, this is a description of human nature. The Apostle Paul describes it this way in the book of Romans, chapter 7, verse 18. I know that no good thing dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. The flesh is the human nature that is devoid of God. That's an essence. You could summarize it this way. The flesh says this, that spiritually before God, we are dead, that morally before God, we are corrupt, and that legally before God, we are guilty. If you just want to take everything in particular that the New Testament says about us spiritually, naturally, that's how you would summarize it. Spiritually dead, morally corrupt, legally guilty of breaking the law of God. Jesus says to Nicodemus, you are of the flesh. Now, he also said this to him. Not only is he of the flesh, but because he's of the flesh, he needs spiritual life. He needs spiritual life because he's spiritually dead. That's what it is to be of the flesh, is to be spiritually dead. Now, Nicodemus obviously is confused about this. Notice he thinks that Jesus is talking about some kind of a rebirth. In other words, in his mind, he's thinking of Jesus saying you must be born again as if Jesus is saying you must have another experience like the first one you had. So somehow there is a re or, or a, a, a rebirth that Jesus is talking about. But Jesus' point is not that he needs a rebirth, not that he needs a birth of the same kind as what he's had before, but he needs a new birth. Jesus is talking here about being born again as a new birth, not another birth of the same kind, but a birth that is entirely different. Not just a birth of the flesh, but he's talking about a birth of the Spirit. Those are in contrast to each other, by the way. This is one of the stumbling points of the gospel, because the gospel isn't just that you've got some problems and need some help. The gospel is that you are helpless. The gospel is that you cannot do for yourself what you need done. That it has to be done by someone else. That's why you're of the flesh or you're of the spirit. So let's make sure that we we get that. See, Nicodemus, he's thinking like a spiritually dead man thinks. Because when Jesus talked to him about being born again, he's thinking to himself, 
how in the world could I have another birth like the one I had before? How in the world can you somehow get into your mother's womb and be born again? That can't happen. You can hear in what he's saying basically something like this. Okay, if I need to be born again, how do I do that? What do I do to be born again? And he's so confused by it. Because it sounds like what you're saying I must do to be born again is to have some kind of a, another birth, like the one I've had before. And you can't do that. That's impossible. So you hear him thinking out loud like a dead man thinks. What can you do? You can't do that. But you see, the gospel is telling us, and and you need to get this this morning, you and I cannot do for ourselves what we need done. We are lost in our sins. We are dead in our sins. Something must be done for us, just like something needed to be done for Nicodemus that is true of us. He needs spiritual life. Three, he's of the flesh. He needs spiritual life. And three, he's outside the kingdom of God. Maybe these are the most sobering words. Verse three, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I'm not going to take time this morning to develop this, but as you go through the Gospels, you'll notice that more or less, kingdom of God is synonymous with eternal life. The Jews believe that those who would be part of, of God's kingdom would be those who would live under the reign of God's king, who would be in the line of David, and that kingdom God promised would be an eternal kingdom. So in in the mind of a Jew, and Nicodemus obviously is a great Jewish man, he would equate kingdom of God, kingdom uh, of God, kingdom of heaven, with the reality of eternal life. Well, Jesus is telling him that you, you don't have eternal life. You're not in the kingdom of God. Now, let's talk about the spirit then that gives life, because we see here that like Nicodemus, we are all spiritually dead and outside the kingdom of God. What is it that God does, does for us? And by the way, it's interesting to me, it's, it's very telling to me, that Jesus first unpacks for him something about the, the nature of this eternal life, something about the nature of being born by the Spirit. In other words, it's important to Jesus. He could just say, okay, you have a problem, and here's the solution. Believe in me. But before he says, believe in me, he unpacks for Nicodemus and us something about the nature of this spiritual life that we need, something about the nature of how this spiritual life is given and received. Jesus wants us to understand those things. There's a reason those verses are there that he doesn't just skip right to believe in me. Hey, don't worry. Don't worry about the details. I know all about the details. I got all that down. Just believe in me. No. There's content to this. So let's let's review it quickly. The new birth that you need is something God does for you. He does it for you by work of the Holy Spirit. Now, physical life is a good illustration of this spiritual life. Stop and think about it. You had nothing to do in the determining of your existence. You had nothing to do with the receiving of life. There's just, at some point in time in your life, you came to the realization that you were alive. (laughs) You did, right? That would be true of all of us. Stop and think about it. And this, again, is one of the reasons that the natural man so rebels against God. Because the very fact that you're existing, the very fact you're sitting there thinking right now, you didn't do something to get that. And in the same way, the spiritual life that you need, it's not something you do to get it, it's something that's done for you. You could take the rest of the Bible and construct this, just like you need uh, a male and female to be conceived physically. Uh, spiritually speaking, there is the Word of God and there's the Spirit of God that are joined together and spiritual life happens. Now, notice what Jesus says about this in verse 6. He said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit, to be born of the Spirit. It sort of harkens back to chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. Look at that sometime to see how 
We're not born of the will of man, but we're born of the will of God. I think there's a connection here with John 1, 12 and 13. For the sake of time, though, let's move on. To be born of the Spirit is to have the Spirit give you life, and this is what makes you alive to God. And when the Spirit gives you this life, the technical theological term is regeneration, but when the, when the Spirit of God gives you this life, when the Spirit of God regenerates you, gives you new life, there's two implications of that, or two realities, I should say. One is there's a cleansing And this cleansing then leads to a real change in your life. This is what Jesus means when he says that in verse 5, that you must be born of water and of the Spirit. What does he mean when he says born of water? I don't believe what he's talking about here is physical birth. Uh, A lot of times you'll see that, that uh, physical birth, your mother goes in labor, her water breaks, And so Jesus, when he says you must be born of water, he's saying that you must have a physical birth. I don't think he's talking here about physical birth. He's not talking here about baptism. I believe that what he's referring to here is what the prophet Ezekiel referred to. Actually, God, through the prophet Ezekiel, in Ezekiel 36, verses 25 through 27, God says, he gives his people this promise, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, or in other words, a heart that's alive. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So this promise that God is giving to put his spirit and to cleanse and to wash the heart, he then says, is the means then by which you change. It's the means by which you keep my law and you obey me and you live in light of of who I am. So this giving life of the spirit is both the cleansing as well as the changing. Notice verse 8, the wind blows where it wishes. Here's Jesus describing this life of the Spirit. And you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. You see, no one controls this. Just like you can't control the wind, it just blows where it will. But you do see the results of it. You see when the tree, the leaves rustle and the, the, the tree bends back and forth you, because that's the wind. So it is with the work of the Spirit. This work of the Spirit that begins with a cleansing is a work then that then is evidenced because of the change that comes to the individual's life. They're following after the will of God. So the life of the Spirit is both a cleansing and it is a changing that is, uh, that's happening in our lives. Now, This is what God does for you. Obviously, much more could be said, but I want you to see this as we move to the last part then of of the simple message this morning. There is, on the one side here, our, our spiritual condition. We're dead in trespasses and sins. We are on our way to perishing and then there is life that is in the Spirit, life then in which you are born again, in which you are in the kingdom of God. How do you get from here to here? That's what we want to answer now. How do you get from here to here? And you get from where you are naturally, spiritually, to life as you believe in Jesus. Now, we could talk a lot this morning about what happens first. Does the Spirit breathe life, and then you believe, or you believe, and then you're regenerated? I believe it's the first, but we're not going to take time to debate that this morning. Why? Because I want you to see what is the clearest thing to see in this text, and that is... I mean, I, what happens first? I open my eyes or I see the light. Try that. I'm not exactly sure, but 
But I do know this. If you believe in Jesus, if you believe in the one that is lifted up, you will have new life. So let's talk about that. Not going to talk much about 11 and 13. Basically, Jesus says to Nicodemus, if you're not getting this basic teaching, you're certainly not going to get heavenly things. I think Nicodemus was, again, coming to get heavenly things. He wanted to go higher, deeper, and what he believed. And Jesus is saying, you're, you're not even the first base yet. Jesus is saying he's the one who's qualified to teach these things because he's descended from above. He's come down from above to earth to teach these things. But I want you to go to 14 and 15. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so he's referring back to an Old Testament story, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. I'm turning quickly back to Numbers chapter 21 because this is the story that Jesus refers to. If you want to turn back there, you can, but let me read this story to you, and then let's talk about what it means and why Jesus used this story to illustrate the reality of believing in him to have eternal life. This is uh, in the context of when Moses is leading the children out of Israel. They're in the wilderness wandering before they get to the promised land. And this is what we read. This is Numbers 21, beginning in verse 4. From Mount Hor they set out by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And they spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. If you know about the story, that's called manna, right? The manna, the grace that God gave them. But uh, they, they said, we loathe this food. So they're obviously, I mean, they're sinning against God, aren't they? sinning against God, against God's leader. They, they are defiant against God. They're defiant against God's grace. They've, they've received the grace of God. I mean, they're getting fed every day just by walking out of their tent and picking it up. And yet that's not good enough. Verse 6, Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Four things about this story. Number one, you'll notice that what God gives them is not preventative. This, this is not a way to keep from getting bitten by snakes. What God gives them is for the condition they're already in. They are bitten and they are dying. So this is a remedy for dying people. Notice also number two, that the snakes were the result of God's wrath. Make no mistake about that. Those snakes that were biting them were sent by God. The text said that God sent fiery serpents among them. This is God's wrath. And so since this is God doing this, God is the one that must solve the problem. Notice they come to a problem, or they they come to Moses with a solution to the problem. It's real easy. Get rid of the snakes. That's not the solution. So these are dying people. That death is the result of God's wrath. The solution to it must be found in God. Number three, God rescues them from the curse with a picture of the curse. Now, this is really odd. It would seem to me like God would say, okay, these nasty, wicked snakes are biting you. Ouch. That's what I say to begin with. This is nasty. You get bitten by one of these things, and then the poison that goes, I mean, this is excruciating uh, death by snake bite. I mean, how bad is that? 
You would loathe these snakes. And I would think God would say, Moses, take a pole and put a butterfly on top of the pole. Put something beautiful on top of that pole, right? Wouldn't you? I mean, you'd think that, wouldn't you? Put something that represents medicine or healing or somehow just put something on the pole that's beautiful to look at. So when you get bit by one of those nasty things, you look at something beautiful. God says, people get this. This is why Jesus, when he's telling Nicodemus how he can have eternal life, chooses this story to illustrate it. In order for the people to be healed from the curse, they had to look the curse in the face. They had to recognize the reason they were dying. Number four. Oh, what wonderful gospel this is. To be cured, you're bitten by one of these nasty creatures and you're dying in agony. To be cured, just look. Look to that serpent that's lifted up. Look. You can't say, no, 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 no. I know how to take care of snake bites. I saw it on TV. You just make a slip. No, 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 no. Here's how you take care of it, God. Just get rid of the snakes. But God in His grace says, I will heal you. In the healing, you're going to have to look my, my wrath right in the face. You're going to have to see the hideousness, the ugliness, the pain, the suffering that has caused this curse. You're going to have to look it right in the face. But if you do, you'll be healed. You'll live. So Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, and he's speaking to us today as well. How do dead people live? They live as they look on the one who's lifted up. That's how they live. Because Jesus said in the same way, the Son of Man is going to be lifted up. We know that when he says that, it is always a reference to the crucifixion. The Son of Man is going to be lifted up on a cross. And what does that cross say to us? What, does, what, what do we see when we see that cross? We see the reason we need healed. We see the reason we've died. We see the reason that we need forgiveness. We see the curse. We see the wrath of God. That's what he makes us see. He makes us deal with the reality of that. As the, as the serpent was lifted up, the Son of Man is going to be lifted up on that cross, and you must look to Him. And in the looking to Him, recognize God's wrath is poured out on Him because of my sin. Paul said, He who knew no sin became sin. That we might know the righteousness of God. We must look upon a son of man that was lifted up and where the, who, the wrath of God poured out on him and say, God, I am in need. I've been bitten by sin. And I know now it's not what I know about the Bible it's not my moral character. It's not what I've achieved. It's not going higher and deeper in religion. It's not anything I can do. I can't solve it. So I'm repenting of anything that I'm looking to that would make me right with you, and I am looking to one and only one, and that is the Son of Man lifted up on a cross. He died, and there when He died, He took all of your wrath that was meant for me and my sin. And there he provided the cleansing, the healing, the new life 
that I need. That's what it is to look. It's all you have to do is look. Have you ever looked? Have you ever looked, and again, this is one of the the themes of John, isn't it? Look, behold something that you might believe. Today, through John 1 through 15, we've, we've lifted up one that if you look at this one, you believe in him, you'll have life. You will be born again. You will not perish. You will enter the kingdom of God forever.